Thank you very much. I start with, uh, I was trained out of college uh, by IBM. I went to work for IBM and was trained by them. I spent two years in training. Because back then, you didn't have university-provided computer science courses or training like that. Very few even taught programming language. It was a very new device. This is the early 60s. So IBM had to train everybody. The year I went to work for them, they hired more college graduates to introduce their new 360 line, more college graduates than any business in the United States. And so I was one of that class. Later, having used uh, my IBM experience to do several things in addition to working for IBM, I ran what was then called a service bureau, and I was a chief information officer for a, a company, and we spun it out, and it became a standalone service bureau for profit. This new company comes into town or starts up across town from us. It actually came over from Little Rock and uh, opened up its operations over by the airport named Federal Express. Started by a young man named Frederick Wallace Smith. And they were in dire need of a computer department, computer systems. They had gone one route and they had some bad experiences. So they wisely came over and asked me if I'd like to join or to sell our service bureau to FedEx. So we did. Why not? Good money. Best deal FedEx ever made. <laughs> and uh, I became the CIO, we didn't call it that then, but that's what it was, of FedEx. FedEx was then at about 8,000 packages a night and had about 10,000 employees. It was four years old. It had started with 22 packages a night in April of 74. And some people think that 20 of those 22 packages were, were birthday cakes that Fred Smith sent to some of his friends. <laughs> First lesson, listen to the customer. They shut the whole thing down for three months and expanded to some more cities. For instance, they were not covering Los Angeles. They were not covering Chicago. Uh, they went to Moline. And, uh, they only had about five cities on the network. At any rate, they started back up and it started growing. By the time I got there, like I say, we were at about 8,000 packages with very weak systems group because it was a new business. And we were charged with and, and built the world's first online tracking tracing system. We call it Cosmos. You have to call them something, right? Customer Online Services Management Operating System which just rolls off the tongue, and <laughs> discovered one of the major lessons of my business career. You see a problem. The problem was nobody had done it before, so we had to invent several things or have companies invent them for us to do it. For example, prior to that, nobody used barcodes for anything other than marking soup cans and grocery products. You know what I mean by the universal product code, barcodes? So we built, with the cooperation of two vendors for equipment and three paper vendors, the first sequentially numbered barcode air bills uh, that had ever existed. These are the way bills that you use with an air shipment. We wanted the system to go to the van so that the courier could receive information about what package he needed to pick up and what he had picked up, because we were an overnight service. Nobody had built that. So we went, found, put together, cobbled together three different companies out of Japan and Canada and the United States and made the first scanners that you see now that are so routine that you can scan a barcode that a courier delivery man does when he brings it to your house that's immediately sent back over a radio system that we built for the vans through a digital radio product that we had found uh, with a company, a little, little bitty company. We saw them at a trade show and we were their first customer and their only customer for a long time so they could take the tracker and put it in the machine in the van and transmit it back to our system. And then we built this very large database system. It was the largest single image IMS system, which was an IBM product, IMS system in the world because every package got scanned 12 times during its transit. On pickup, on transit, on sort, on outsort, on down, you get the picture. It's a lot of data. 
with a very long air bill number. So it was a huge database. And this was in the very early uh, uh, 80s by then, late 70s, early 80s. But it worked. And it became a very important part of the FedEx system because the information about a package that means something to you quite often is just as important as the package itself. If you know that it's in your town and out for delivery, that gives you a lot of peace. Prior to that, nobody had that. Prior to FedEx, nobody had Overnight Express. That was Fred's great idea in a paper he wrote at Yale when he was at school there, before he went off to Vietnam for two tours. One is a ground infantry officer with the Marines, and next is a Marine aviator. That was important because Fred, who had learned to fly at age 15, loved airplanes, loves flying, still does. Fascinated by it. So he starts a company that, hey, uses airplanes. Makes sense. But that also was propitious timing, as your previous film showed, because that was the time that America was, or the world was building and being introduced to the high bypass fan jet engine, which was fuel efficient enough for you to be able to fly across America at a reasonable price, or to fly packages from LA to Memphis, sort the packages, and fly them on to New York at a reasonable price. The cost was low enough because of the savings on jet fuel, that you could then charge a price that a customer is willing to pay for overnight express. FedEx grew because of a lot of things, but the most important, and I'll introduce it a little later in more detail, but it was called the networking effect. There had been networks before, of course, AT&T uh, telephone network, their wireline voice network, a marvel of engineering, but it had taken them 100 years to get to 75 million customers. Think about that. To get to 100 million Facebook users, I think it took Mark about six weeks. <laughs> the power of networks, we'll come back to that. So anyway, FedEx is going along and booming and growing and at a speed that nobody had seen before. It became the darling of Wall Street. There was a book written about them called FedEx, the darling of Wall Street, because the stock had done so well. And shortly after we developed our tracking system, Fred asked me to become the chief operating officer. So I got a broader exposure to a lot of the other issues in a fast growing major industrial company that was highly dependent on systems. We couldn't do anything about it. We, our weather systems combined with our flight tracking systems and pilot communication systems and maintenance systems for our aircraft and hub information systems and the way we ran the whole company, including the tracking of all packages, was a very integrated, very large systems project. And so I learned a lot about that. And we had a great team. To the earlier point, the team is the most important thing in anything. They're the ones that create the ideas that solve the problems. At any rate, we go on and we're now blowing and going and as chief operating officer, I became intimately aware of a lot of things that can start or stop progress of a corporation or business, particularly a high growth, fast moving business. One of them is, is that the management thinks they're all knowing and the rest of the people kind of supposed to go along for the ride. We introduced a thing called the Guaranteed Fair Treatment Project, which every Tuesday, Fred and I and our head of personnel would sit down to air any employee grievance from anywhere in the world They'd come to Memphis, they'd sit down and say their boss had, had uh, not treated them right, hadn't given them appropriate attention, given them a raise or whatever. We discovered issues, some of the darker issues of, of large numbers of people in management. We overruled management about 31% of the time in any one given year, which some might think is a lot, some might think is not enough. But the fact is we were willing to be objective about it and nothing was sacred. As a result, FedEx became the largest non-union transportation company in the world because we accomplished for the employees, we call them couriers and other associates, partners, what no union could accomplish. We paid union wages because that was a competitive market. We had some very large union competitors like UPS. So we had to be competitive with our wages, but we also guaranteed a treatment fair treatment process for justice. That's what all employees want. As a result, we continue to grow and add. In some years, we'd have to promote 7,000 people into management who had been basically blue collar workers. So we put a big management training institute. Well, at any rate, after about 10 years of doing that, I was 
recruited away uh, by a company in Seattle called McCall Communications. I go up to Seattle, and this is another rocket taken off. This was the very early days of cellular telephony, 1990. Sailor business grew rapidly, had a great time, marvelous team in different regions around that we covered. Seattle, we were in San Francisco. We, there were only two carriers in each city back then. You could, one or two. Our incumbent carrier was always the Bell Operating Company. So we would go, Seattle, we opened. San Francisco, Portland, Los Angeles on the West Coast, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston and Texas. You get the drift. We, we went for the bigger markets. Miami, uh, New York. And by that time, we were doing about two and a half million subscribers. We were the largest sailor company in the world with two and a half million. They sell that many smartphones, sailor phones, about every 10 minutes now. There are two billion people on the internet. This year, 2015, will be the first year that the number of devices will exceed uh, the number of people on the internet. Devices this year finished out will be about four billion. And by 2025, there'll be 250 billion devices hooked to the internet. So that was the next experience. After, after McCall, I got, we sold McCall to AT&T and it became AT&T Wireless. And I was the first CEO and I'm very proud of that. It's a very different AT&T Wireless than the one you see today, but that's where they got their start. They weren't in that business before us. And I get a call, well, we sell the company to AT&T and I get a call from some people down in the valley in, in, in Mountain View, California, say, we'd love for you to come down here and go with this startup company. You know, we don't have any revenue, but we got about 10 people that are really smart. <laughs> and they're all about 12 years old. <laughs> but you seem to have a knack for this, so I'll go down there. The first thing we did, we changed the name of the company from Mosaic to Netscape. And at Netscape, I could give you a few of the things, but a couple of the, we had a great product, products, we had two. One was a browser that they had built, and one was a server for internet protocol serving of web pages. It was the first real combination of the World Wide Web and the internet, and with the browser, it made it usable by mere mortals. Our Netscape browser became the standard interface, and we added things to it like email and other things later on, but it exploded. To give you an idea, the night we downloaded our, our beta product, which was in December of about uh, 94, give or take, there were bets around the office. How many, how many are gonna get downloaded? We didn't even know how many people were out on the internet. <laughs> Turns out there were about two million at that time. How many were going to download? There were bets like 20,000, 30,000, 50,000. First night, one and a half million. We came in the office the next morning, people just fell out. I mean, flopped. <laughs> we could not believe it. And that's when we knew we had a product. Other thing about the internet, you could put something up on a web page. We had these great web pages because nobody else had them, so we had these graphics. We had a video cam on a fish aquarium there in the office called Fish Cam. Great. <laughs> but it demonstrated video over our browser. People would sit there and look at it for hours. <laughs> and the two guys in the cubicle with it, they'd just throw in a little feed every now and then and keep working. <laughs> that you, the network expanded so fast, so rapidly, more and more people got on the internet because now they could use the World Wide Web with the, with the Netscape browser. It was just like color television was introduced when Disney brought in the first Wonderful world of color, people went out and bought color television sets, a very expensive item at the time. The company grew and it was wonderful to watch. And we had some of the most wonderful young people I've ever been around, smart, aggressive, <coughs> dedicated, hardworking. And I could tell you a hundred stories about them. But in 1999, we sold that company to AOL. And shortly after that, AOL merged with Time Warner so I've had three great rocket rides in those three companies. And I've learned three or four things, similar to what Gross said before, I'd argue with him a little bit. The most important thing is having the right people. 
because the right people will make the second most important thing happen, the right product. And then the third thing is to give the very best service you can give, which is part of the product, of course, in most cases. And then the third thing is to have a better, a tighter control over the financial situation and to be honest with yourself. Are we tracking with the numbers we're supposed to hit? I've seen some companies get very sloppy in their receivables and their payables and the way they account for their things and, and in using too much money too quickly. So people, service, profit. People, service, or product, profit. Timing, of course, as Gross said, timing is everything. It wouldn't have done Fred much good to think of FedEx in 1955 because they didn't have jet speed airplanes of the size that would have moved the packages overnight. It wouldn't have done Netscape much good to think of the browser in 1985 because the internet wasn't there yet and the World Wide Web wasn't there yet. The internet was there, but not the World Wide Web. And of course, the sailor business was grown because that's what sailor were. But all three of these had one common characteristic as a business. What was it? Jim Barksdale. <laughs> no. Jim Barksdale was just a blind-ass lucky guy <laughs> that happened to flow through town at the right time. No, they all had one great, one thing characteristic. FedEx, the sailor business, and then Netscape. They were all networking companies. The power of a net, or the value of a network, defined by Metcalf in the 80s, a good friend of mine, it was on his board. The value of a network is the number of endpoints, nodes, on the network, times the number of endpoints minus one, yourself. So it doesn't just go exponentially. Sure, exponentially it goes like this. Networks, if they're on a exponential curve because they grow at these rapid rates, go straight up almost. We'd open a city for FedEx. Virginia Beach, Virginia. FedEx will finally reach to Virginia Beach. I remember opening it up. Or Moscow. Or Beijing. And it isn't just the growth of that city sending packages, parcels. It's all the other cities in the world that want to send things to them. So they start shipping items that they heretofore didn't ship with us. They may not have been a customer of ours. The value of networks is the most powerful thing I've ever seen. And those are the three great rockets I've ridden. And they've taught me great lessons. Thank you all very much. Good luck to you.